Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're doing money banking and the central banking system. We'll be defining what money is, what is the money supply process, so how banks or financial institutions are involved in creating money supply, and lastly, what is the role of the central bank in trying to control the money supply in our economy. So let's start with definition of money. Money is any asset that which is readily accepted as a form of payment for goods and services. The most common types of money that we see in our daily lives are your currency in circulation, and checkable deposits. Currency in circulation is remember cash outside of banks held by the public. So it could be the cash in your wallet, it could be the cash that you have underneath your mattress or in your closet at home. This is not cash inside a bank. Checkable deposits or demand deposits are now your accounts at financial institutions on which you can write checks. So by simply writing a check, you can use that asset as a form of payment. Hence, it is money for us in our economy. So if I have different type of financial assets that can be used as money, in order to look at the total stock of money in my economy or money supply, all I have to do is look at the total value of these financial assets which are considered money. Now what assets should we include in our aggregation of money supply? Any asset which fulfills three main functions is considered money for that economy. So before we go to money aggregates and see how do we quantify money in our economy, let's first look at what are these three main functions. The first one is that that asset should be a good medium of exchange, meaning that that asset should be universally accepted as a form of payment in that particular economy. And remember the asset should not be acquired for its own consumption, but primarily for exchanging of goods and services. Secondly, that asset should be able to retain its value over time. So it should not deteriorate very quickly. It should be a good store of value. Lastly, all economic transactions and prices of goods and services should be in terms of that particular asset or in that particular unit. So for example, my Canadian dollar, I can use it to purchase a cup of coffee, to buy a new phone, to buy a new laptop, etc. So my Canadian dollars, whether in the form of cash or checkable deposits, are serving my purpose of being a medium of exchange. I can also put my Canadian dollars in my saving account or a fixed term deposit. So I'm now storing value over time in the form of my Canadian dollars. So it's now fulfilling my second function of money, which is of being a good store of value. Lastly, all listed prices in Canada at the grocery store or the price of a new house that's listed on the market, price of a used car or a new car, all of these prices or economic transactions are measured in terms of Canadian dollars. So Canadian dollar for our economy is the primary unit of account. So therefore we can say that the Canadian dollar is fulfilling all three roles and is hence being used as money in our economy. Now, was money always in the form of cash or checkable deposits? In fact, there was a time when there was no money. So when we had no money, we had what we call as the barter system. In a barter system, we had goods and services being exchanged for goods and services. However, the problem with barter is that it had very high transaction costs. What are transaction costs? In a barter system, a requirement for exchange to occur is that you have to find someone who is willing to offer you something that you need while at the same time you should be able to offer that person something that he or she needs. So this is referred to as double coincidence of wants. In order to fulfill this particular requirement, people had to spend a lot of time and effort to find that trading partner. These high transaction costs are going to create inefficiencies in this market economy and overall we will not see a lot of exchange occurring in this economy. So as societies developed, they started moving away from barter. Within that barter economy, they started gravitating towards certain commodities which were more acceptable than others for exchange. And that is the first type of money that we see historically, your commodity money. Commodity money is any asset which is used as a medium of exchange, but it has some intrinsic value of its own. The most common types of commodity money historically have been your gold, silver, or any other types of precious metals. But we have also seen other examples of commodity money in the form of pearls, tobacco leaves, in fact, even dates being used in certain societies at certain points in time. Commodity money then evolved into commodity backed money. As you can imagine, commodity money is not easy to carry and not easy to transport from one place to another. Therefore, we saw the evolution of paper currency or paper notes. Paper currency is now your commodity backed money, which has no intrinsic value of its own. So it's just a piece of paper, but it is backed by some commodity. So it is guaranteed by a promise that it can be converted into some equivalent amount of some valuable good. That valuable good was primarily 
primarily gold or silver and we had commodity backed money or gold standard all the way into the 1930s. After World War I, the gold standard collapsed and we saw governments and central banks cease to redeem their paper currency into gold and therefore we saw the rise of what we call fiat money. Fiat money is simply your medium of exchange which has no intrinsic value of its own and it is not backed by any commodity. So where does the worth or the value of the fiat money come from? Its value entirely derives from the fact that it is deemed legal tender by the government or the central bank of that economy. It's the central bank which issues currency and is also responsible for ensuring that no counterfeiting is being done. Fiat money as legal tender simply means that merchants cannot refuse payments in the form of this money. It can be now used as repayment of debt or for paying of taxes in that particular economy. Fiat money has seen its own evolution. We have seen it evolving from paper currency and coins to checkable deposits and moving on we have seen it evolving into electronic payments. So we can now use our plastic money or debit cards to purchase goods and services which is essentially giving us the ability to access our checking accounts but instead of now writing checks we can use our plastic debit cards to access those accounts. The next step in the evolution of money is now your cryptocurrency. Is cryptocurrency like Bitcoin money? In order to answer that, you should simply go back to your functions of money. Any commodity that fulfills these three main functions is money. So if your Bitcoins are readily accepted as a means of payment, they are stable in value. They do not rise or fall very quickly in value. And all economic transactions are in that particular unit then that particular cryptocurrency can be called money. However, we see that most of the cryptocurrency out there is too volatile, so it's not stable, it's not a good reliable store of value, at least not as yet. It is not readily accepted by all merchants out there, and not all economic transactions are mired in that particular unit of account. But with changing technologies and changing economies, maybe in the next few years, we will see cryptocurrencies being adopted by central banks, and we might see evolution of money in that particular direction. Now that we know what assets can be included in money, let's look at how our central banks measures the money supply. Central bank has what we call monetary aggregates. These monetary aggregates will be helpful in measuring the total stock of money in our economy. Now monetary aggregates will look at not just your most liquid assets like currency and checkable deposits, but also some near monies. Near monies are your financial assets that cannot be directly used as a medium of exchange, but can be readily converted into cash or a checkable deposit and then used as a medium of exchange. Examples of near monies could be your saving and fixed term deposits or your money market mutual funds. Remember stocks and bonds are never going to be part of our money supply because they're simply not liquid enough. The transaction cost of converting stocks and bonds into a liquid asset like cash or checkable deposit is too high. A monetary aggregate starts with M1 plus and this is all of your currency outside of banks and our checkable deposits. Now, whenever you see the plus sign, this refers to the fact that these deposits, in our case, checkable deposits at all financial institutions. So these could be checkable deposits at chartered banks, checkable deposits at trust and mortgage loan companies, and checkable deposits at credit unions or Caisse Populaire in Quebec. If you do not see the plus sign, it would refer to currency and checkable deposits at chartered banks only. In the United States, the narrowest monetary aggregate is M1, whereas in Canada, we start with M1+, plus, so currency and checkable deposits at all financial institutions. Next, we have broader monetary aggregates like M2, M2+, plus, M3, and so on. These broader categories would include more near money, so like your saving and term deposits, and in some cases, your mutual funds or foreign currency accounts of residents. The distinction between these monetary aggregates will become clear with our next slide. We have over here M1, M2 and M2 plus. As you can see out of these three M1 plus is the narrowest monetary aggregate. It has currency and checkable deposits at all of these different types of financial institutions. M2 builds upon M1. So M2 would be currency and your checkable deposits at chartered banks only. Note there is no plus sign over here, so I'm ignoring deposits at other financial institutions. But since it's a broader monetary aggregate, it does not only include checkable deposits, but it also includes your non-personal demand and notice deposits. M2 plus is even bigger than M2, so it has everything that's in M2. But on top of that, it has similar deposits at these other financial institutions as well. 
M2 Plus also includes your money market mutual funds and also your life insurance company individual annuities. As we move from a narrower monetary aggregate to a broader monetary aggregate, we have more and more near monies being added into it. Also note as the monetary aggregate becomes bigger, there is a higher opportunity cost of converting these assets into cash. These near monies are giving me some type of interest income. So whenever I convert them into M1 only assets, cash or checkable deposits, I will be giving up on this interest income. So the opportunity cost of holding M1 only assets increases as we move from a narrower monetary aggregate to a broader monetary aggregate.